I appreciate your coming out. I think this will be a really interesting event. It's a, a little bit of a different topic than we do most times. The topic is smart governance, how public policy can keep pace with technological developments. And when I was thinking about this event, uh, I thought about how we're entering, or we've entered uh, uh, an era of data abundance, right? And the product of all being networked and connected and having digital devices is an immense quantity of data on all kinds of activities from all kinds of sources, whether it's sensors or smartphones or geolocation or wireless networks. And this data abundance will change the security environment. It will change the business environment, and it's changing the social environment, but it will change the security environment. So the increasing availability of data is a challenge for governments and policymakers, and finding new tools for governance and for security um, will be necessary, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, let me give you a brief overview of the event. Uh, we will start, uh, as soon as I finish speaking, with the Honorable Secretary General of the Netherlands Ministry of Security and Justice, Mr. Peter Klu, who will give keynote remarks. Um, we'll follow this with a panel that I'll moderate uh, with Prof Professor Franz Liu, Director of Scientific Research and Documentation, also at the Ministry of Security and Justice. Dr. Robert Griffin, the uh, Acting Deputy Undersecretary for Science and Technology. Many of us know him from his uh, previous life, of course, and uh, uh, very happy he could be here. Um, Dr. Chris Kirchhoff, we have so many doctors on this panel, it's like being in a hospital. Um, <laughs> Dr. Chris Kirchhoff, who is the senior advisor to the counselor to the president, AKA John Podesta, and was one of the uh, authors of the recent report on big data. Uh, also works at JCS, has a long career at DOD, and so i um, very grateful that Chris could be here. And finally, Dr. Rob DeWick, I told you everyone was a doctor, who's the director for the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. So what we'll do is we'll have opening the speech, followed by a panel, and then a reception uh, after this. We should run till about five o'clock. Uh, we'll see how long it takes. And then uh, please stay and have a drink with us when we're done. But uh, Peter, if I could invite you up to speak. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your introduction uh, this afternoon. I believe we could have uh, um, get even more money for the tickets because there's a lot of people who come extra uh, this afternoon, but it stayed on the price we had initially thought about it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very welcome to this uh, symposium. Uh, I'm as a secretary general of the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands. Uh, we are here to establish the relationship with, uh, between the Netherlands and the US. Um, we try to get some new arrangements, and we already did with uh, my delegation. Um, and the third thing is that we are talking and we are trying to get new insights and also can give some answers and uh, some information about things we are doing on cyber, on uh, forensic, etc. I will gi give you a brief introduction. Uh, and I heard already Rob de Wijk is, of course, for the international studies in The Hague. But he is here especially because he is leading um, a combination from universities two ministries and about 150 companies in the Hague Security Delta where we cope together on innovation, etc., on security. And we try to get also in contact with uh, people and uh, to do some new projects and etc. cetera. Um, the Ministry of Security and Justice um, only has been there for about three years. Um, and the reason is that um, it is a, a very big ministry at this moment. Uh, we, I think about 40% about of the whole Dutch governmental staff is within the Ministry of uh, Security and Justice. That's because of the police is 
part of the Ministry of, uh, of uh, has become uh, part of the Ministry of Justice. So we are now security and justice. But also it's um, just being there three years and it's, let's say, a merger, a group of companies and we try to get some cement between the companies to, uh, to uh, see how we can cope with uh, criminality, uh, etc. Um, under the ministry, we have the National Police since 2013, the National Police. Before that, there were 26 regional police forces. That was very difficult for us. Um, the prosecution and the judges are part are under the umbrella of my ministry. Uh, then we have the prisons, we have counterterrorism, cyber, and so on, and that's the whole department. We had uh, marvelous talks and uh, meetings the last uh, three days uh, here in the US. We are very happy to be here and to, uh, to see another day coming. Uh, the weather is very good. We had some space in uh, the cargo uh, department of uh, the plane, so we took some nice weather with us, and uh, I think we, we succeeded already in that. That We are very happy that uh, this nice weather. Um, when we look what's happening, that is the times... Uh, these are the times of very rapid changes. Uh, Counterterrorism has turned into a cyber part and a foreign fighter part. And it was 10 years ago, of course, you know, totally other issue. Um, we try, uh, we see that also in the Netherlands, we see the same issues. So we have to turn the Dutch government and all the bodies who are working on this area we have to, uh, to change that. Uh, we have also uh, to get the system, the juridical system, uh, more up to date. I think in its justice part, I think we're about 10 to 15 years behind in ICT. That's not on cyber, that's not on forensic, but on all the other things we are doing between the prosecution, police, and uh, and uh, judges, we are far behind. So we have an investment program only for the Netherlands, uh, I think almost, it will be about a billion euro uh, for the next few years. So we had a large plan because we have to fit to get caught uh, on criminals, to exchange information um, between the Netherlands and other countries, uh, e-justice, what we call it in uh, Europe at, at this moment, we are developing in a rapid way. So we have to do that uh, very rapidly because otherwise the criminals will be in ahead of us. The key word, I would say, uh, is innovation. The key word is innovation. But what we saw is that we had an innovation that everyone did a part innovation. And what we now did in the last uh, two years is that we try to get focus on the innovation. And we have some people here, Bert Klaassen, uh, who is now in charge within our ministry on the innovation because to, we want to have focused innovation and not just innovation to put some money on the street. Um, and when you think about innovation, um, how will it be successful? And then you can see that as you may know, if you have some experience there, you have to, to create a culture of innovation. And let me give one example how we don't, uh, what we don't want and what we indeed want. When I was head of the national police in the board uh, for a year, before I started one and a half year as, uh, ago as a secretary general, then within the police force, in the 26 forces, they all had their own innovation. So on one functionality, let's say number plate recognition, they, we had 43 projects. Nothing would be on a general scale uh, uh, set out. 
So we are just throwing away some money, and they call it innovation. That's not what I call innovation. Innovation is, and you try something new, you get the universities with it. Um, you want you try to get also uh, companies uh, to fit in, and then you try to see if there are two, three, four ways uh, we probably could on one functionality could get a stop step further. And that's what we call innovation. And But we have to do that, and we can't have 43 projects, because then we are throwing away the money. Um, so a culture of innovation is um, important. Um, that needs also a staff that's open to innovation. So the senior um, uh, the senior directors have to be open for innovation. I'm not saying, oh, we saw that already 10 years ago, and then we put it away. So we try to get people who are thinking and acting out of the box. That is a little bit uh, strange sometimes within the Ministry of Justice, but we have to do that, and we are doing that at this very moment. In the US, of course, you have the companies like Apple, Google, etc. Uh, those are IT companies, but you don't have them to tell how they are getting on with innovation. So we have to learn from that kind of companies. Um, so we have to be open on the ideas from society, on the ideas from other countries. That's the reason that we are here, and in a month we are in China, etc. So we have to be open for new ideas not closing discussion, just opening discussion and keeping on those discussion and making projects with a lot of people and uh, parties. Um, that also means that making a network on the innovation is very important. Um, and the network is what I called the Hague Security Delta where and for, uh, for universities but also uh, two ministries and also more than 150 companies are working together to on the innovation on security. Um, and that's the reason that we try to get that type of networks because then we can act, we can learn, we can uh, provide new projects and we can provide results also to society. Um, and we are happy to be founder of uh, those, the Hague Security Delta, what we call, because it's only in, in the security and uh, justice cluster. We uh, did a good job last, uh, last March uh, when we had the nuclear security summit in the Netherlands. And we made a lot of progress on about, I believe, about 50 uh, innovation we worked on a year and we applied it during the NSS. And that was very interesting uh, to see that. And we made also an innovation room uh, to let people, journalists, uh, people from other countries, uh, so they could see what was happening. It's an interesting, if you want to know more, Rob de Wijk, Bud Klaassen, and some others are here uh, in, this, uh, in this room. Um, I'm convinced that we have uh, to get progress on these innovations because we are sometimes behind, uh, behind uh, the criminals. We see in the Netherlands and the UK has the same issue that we have some criminals who try to laundry money in Spain and we don't get hold on that issue. But we try to get... Uh, the money away there, assets, we try to get the assets, but we have to then to exchange more information between the countries on the re juridical level. And we are now um, at the moment to do that. Um, and the innovation where we are working on makes us work smarter, more quickly, safely, sustainably, to sustainably and of, often with less money, less people. 
but more on, based on IT. Um, so we are now working on a ministry-wide uh, innovation agenda, which includes one, a list of strategic subjects we need, to know, uh, we need to know more about. Second is uh, a list of uh, subjects uh, which, which could be solved by innovations. And uh, we want also to, to see which steps, that's the third thing, uh, we can take to encourage a culture of innovation. That's the interesting part, and we hope to have also this afternoon more information about that. Uh, we will present the innovation agenda um, just after uh, uh, holidays, after the summer, in the end of uh, this year. Um, and that will help us to uh, develop a comprehensive innovation policy for the ministry with our two ministers from migration, migration and justice. Uh, this policy will help us perform uh, in the most important social uh, tasks more quickly and efficiently. I'm convinced about it. And that has to lead to a safer society founded on a strong, effective legal order. I thank you very much. The panel. Well, thank you for those remarks. And I think to create a little space, I'm going to stand up here at the podium. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do is begin, perhaps, by asking the panelists uh, a few questions. And we'll open it up to you. But maybe we could start with each of them giving. They all have a different perspective. They all have a different responsibilities. Maybe they could, uh, as they answer the questions I'm going to start with, work in um, their additional remarks and think about uh, about uh, what it is we want to uh, discuss here today. Um, let me start by asking them. Um, so we've heard a speech about innovation agenda and uh, <clears throat> what are the big innovations we ought to be thinking about? Um, Rob, should we start with you? Sure. So, go ahead. And we'll just we'll go up and down the row and that will make it easy. I'm <clears throat> Thank you. To be here today. Um, the question about innovation um, is important because innovation, to use the analogy, is sort of like pornography. It seems so the eye is beholder, you know it when you see it. Um, part, part of what I see is that you're starting to see. I'm sorry, can you hear me in the back now? The joke was brilliant at the beginning, yeah. I just, it, but it's only good once, so I can't repeat it. Bob, your <laughs> remarks have become suddenly much it, more interesting. It is. So. <laughs> or less, depending on where you are in the room. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the issue of innovation is a, it, it's a challenge for, for us. Um, we have an opportunity, though, to look at what, what I call convergence. So as we start to think about data, and we start to think about um, interoperability, and we start to think about communications, and we start to think about gear, you can start to see where this issue of how we can operationalize data and bring it to the street and really change society, really change how first responders can respond as far as the security is concerned. But you have to th stop thinking about these issues as, as separate siloed um, areas of, of investigation. Data is only as good as, uh, as, as how we use it. Um, there's a proliferation of data. Data is all around us, and it's going to continue to grow. That's both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, if I were to use, uh, if I was to geolocate all of the data that we could have in, in DC, the, the map would be black. There'd be so much data that you couldn't use it. 
So part of what we have to think about is, is not just innovation, but how we use tools differently that we already have. Um, and that's a challenge. That's not always easy. But it's part of the opportunity that I see with both data and security. Oh, great. Thank you. Sure. Um, Chris, uh, you, of course, worked on the White House Big Data Report. Uh, and so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and where you think it came out, what you think it, it sort of left up in the, the air for things we have to do in the future. So. I'm sure. Well, it's uh, very exciting to have a report. Um, you have one copy with me here, but if you go to whitehouse.gov slash big data, uh, you can read it for yourself, along with the fact sheet and a whole bunch of other supplementary information. Um, it was an interesting process to watch the 90-day study come together. Um, as you all know, 90 days is a very quick time period to uh, produce a comprehensive report. Um, but nevertheless, in that amount of time, um, a very talented team in the White House came together with some folks um, across the government, including the Secretary of Energy, the President's Science Advisor, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, and, uh, and some others and um, had a phenomenal series of interactions with stakeholders of all kinds. We met with everyone from European privacy officials to members of industry um, to uh, other uh, folks across the federal government and even local and state governments that are doing interesting things with data. Um, we are unquestionably in a, a kind of golden age of innovation so far as data as, is concerned. Um, I'm uh, on this particular topic just uh, coming away from the study, frankly, amazed at um, all the different places that big data will come to figure. Um, as the report notes, um, there are many, many opportunities uh, for the government, for uh, the commercial sector uh, to use big data to enhance how we live and work. Um, there are also a number of challenges uh, from a pu public policy st uh, standpoint that come along with the use of big data. Uh, the report in particular uh, looks at potentially discriminatory uses of big data, which was an unexpected finding of the group. We went in not at all imagining that uh, we would uh, find uh, that big data effectively eclipses many of the regulatory frameworks of, that the US, in the U.S. context have been used to regulate health, employment, education, and many other areas of our lives for, for a long time. Um, but that said, the report, I think, um, does catalog a number of really interesting opportunities, and hopefully later on the panel I'll get to talk a bit more about those. Maybe I can just take a pause here from going on the row and say, Bob, you have real operational experience, and so maybe you could tell us in a, in a few words how you think the access to data will, will change the safety procedures, law enforcement, fire and rescue. How, what should we look for in the future? What do you think will change? Yeah, well, there we go. Push the button. Thank you for the, for the signal in the back. Um, I'll call, uh, I'll call out what work that's being done in New York City on the Center for Urban Strategies and Progress at NYU. If you get an opportunity to check out the website, go to cusp.nyu.edu. It's pretty interesting because what they're doing is they're starting to look at all of the subsystems within the system, so it's within the city. So they're looking at New York as a basically a laboratory of how to pull together urban studies in, in informatics. Um, so some of the projects that they're looking at is how could you start to think about combining um, your first responder data for your emergency medical systems with your transportation system data, um, with your hospital access and availability, and the type of call that you have in order to be able to send not just the closest ambulance, but send that ambulance to the hospital that has the, the subject matter experts that can deal with that person who is in need. So you start to think about how you could combine m multiple systems together in order to address those uh, to address that medical issue. You start to think about the ability of the police um, to work with the transportation officials. Um, who was in the D.C. area when we had the whole issue of the uh, of the sniper? Remember the situation where we had a uh, the sniper loose in the area, basically terrorized the entire community. Um, the police were looking for white vans, um, that proverbial white van. Imagine a situation, though, where there was a report of a bank robbery or a sniper situation, and the police could work with the transportation systems. And you could shrink the light cycles of uh, your red lights from you know, 15 seconds to 30 seconds to even a minute without people even knowing it. You could shrink your, uh, the, the, the parameter that the police would have to look for, for uh, the, bad, the bad guys. 
So if you start to think about our ability to use existing systems that we have in order to meet some of these pressing public policy uh, issues or public safety issues, there's huge potentials. And this isn't wild sci-fi. These are just systems that already exist, but we haven't figured out how to work them together for the best needs of the community. Um, Sure, well, it's the CUSP, it's CUSP, C-U-S-P. So it's the Center for Urban Strategies and Progress. And, and I, I do a lot of work with, uh, with, with the geovisualization, you know, and the big companies, you think about Esri and you think about Google, but you think about some of the uh, academic communities. Um, Purdue is doing a lot of work. Rutgers is doing a lot of work. USC, Stanford, and uh, CUSP is really interested because they've set a whole center up, and, and the mayor put a lot of money into the center, and it's looking specifically at the city. Um, it's, it's doing some neat stuff like measuring, um, measuring effluence um, to see if it can't be a predetermination for outbreak of diseases, to see if they can't start to measure the, the fact that there's going to be a particularly bad flu season. Not very, you know, I don't want to get scatological, it's not, it's not uh, lovely work to think about, but you think about the systems that it takes to run a community and how we can pull that information off to really understand the, the health of the community. Um, it's huge potential, and that's what the promise of big data can provide us. Thanks, and it, what, one of the things I hope we'll have time to come back to is uh, something I know Chris focused on in the report, which is the implications for uh, privacy in particular of all this. And, but before we do that, I wanted to ask uh, Franz to perhaps, the question, if, if you could remember, was, you know, what are the, what are the um, big innovations we should be thinking about in this field. Uh, before I say that, I, I fully agree with the, uh, p uh, see the the situation you described, where big data are very important. If you if you see uh, the beautiful little institute at the United Nations level, Global Pulse, where big data are brought in line with development aid questions, remote monitoring instead of asking people questions. You know, when it rains, nobody answers the question, and now you have the data available. Very small unit, beautiful work uh, for that field. If you see what, what, what Hopkins did with, uh, you know, the Google prediction, although there was critique on the methodology, in my office in the Netherlands, we try to uh, forecast certain things, and till now we use looking back data from, let's say, Statistics Netherlands. But you can also try to get these data by looking into the same uh, way as dengue and, uh, and, and, and the, the Google influenza has been treated, which is not only cheaper but much faster. Uh, for me, that's a very big innovation. And if I may add one other thing, um, when cyber and biosocial studies go together, it is even getting more interesting because we know and particularly because of a number of Americans who have been working in this field for a longer time than Europeans, that, you know, what causes terrorists and, you know, organized crime and killers and psychopaths and, you know, the, even, uh, as they call them, CU people, callous, unemotional people, there are definitely also biological aspects related to that. If you have these data, you can add that. Um, that can also, I think, be very uh, helpful in uh, predicting certain things. But I agree, privacy is then really, really a big issue. Yeah, I, um, some of you may have heard me say this before, but I know one of the companies that develops uh, algorithms for data mining and data services. And um, I didn't know this. You can buy uh, Twitter data in bulk. And so people tweet really strange things, like they'll tweet, you know, red dots on arm, right? And you can use it to predict unemployment and disease outbreaks and social unrest. So this bulk data is a very powerful tool, but I think we will have to come back to the issue of uh, privacy. Um, Rob, let me let me turn to you before we do that. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Or I do have a question. And the question is, when um, we talk about uh, innovations that we should be thinking about for governance and for security, what is it that you, uh, you're you looking at? What is it you would put at the top of your list? Oh, we look at, uh, at many things, especially clusters of, uh, of, of issues. But let me quickly uh, explain what the Hague Security Delta is, because most of the people in the room might not know it. It was uh, mentioned a couple of times uh, by the... Uh, by the Secretary General. Uh, Secretary General uh, also said that uh, in the Netherlands we should create uh, this culture of innovation, and I fully agree. And uh, I think it is also my task as General Director of the Security Delta to assist him in creating this uh, uh, culture of innovation. This is not, not something that comes natural. 
for example, if you make the comparison between defense, the Ministry of Defense in the Netherlands and the Ministry of, of, of Security and, and Justice, uh, defense has a, a very, very long tradition in this and a very close cooperation with, in, uh, with industry and knowledge institutes. Now, this is something we are now also organizing for, um, for national security, and that is quite interesting. And we have two aims, and that is drive economic growth and produce innovations, uh, security innovations uh, for, ex for acceptable money, uh, for acceptable costs. Now, what are we aiming uh, at? Um, there are a couple of clusters, and uh, what we try to do is we, we focus, we link this uh, to our uh, national security uh, strategy. So uh, we defined uh, what the security of the Netherlands is and how it could be uh, uh, negatively, uh, negatively uh, be affected. And, uh, for the, uh, and based on that, uh, we came up with six focal areas. That is national security uh, in the first place, and that deals, for example, uh, with questions how to uh, arrange your, your, your command and control, how to do it, uh, what kind of procedures uh, do you want to have, because we also came to the conclusion that technology is important, but it's not everything. Uh, you, you also should have the concept right. There should be a mentality. Uh, uh, of uh, which, which allows you uh, to uh, to do uh, national security, disaster management, uh, disaster relief in an effective uh, way. Because if you don't have the concepts and, and you do not think in an operational way, uh, then you simply do not have uh, uh, the desired uh, results. Cybersecurity is a very important one, uh, I think, all over the world. Critical infrastructure, which is also, uh, of course, closely linked to the whole issue of um, of cybersecurity, urban security, which is becoming more and more uh, important. It's a broad area, uh, but this, for example, linked to the issue of ca camera surveillance. Uh, forensics, very important. I think that, uh, that the Netherlands is indeed uh, world class in this, in this field. And of course, education. We came to the conclusion that, uh, especially in the field of uh, cybersecurity, we lack expertise. Everybody is dealing uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the topic. Uh, very, um, uh, or many people have an opinion about um, uh, cybersecurity, but there is actually very little real expertise. So we started uh, a cybersecurity academy in order to fill the gap. Um, let me say, if you have questions, go ahead and interrupt me. I have loads of questions, so I'm going to keep going until they uh, they're exhausted. But um, the the questions, not the panel. But uh, um, maybe what we'll do is we'll leap to the, the privacy issue because I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to get a survey here between the Europeans and the Americans, but um, I really was troubled by the recent decision about uh, the right to forget. And I think that might be a, a cultural difference between the US and Americans. I, it, it would be interesting to see. So maybe we can go down the panel again and have people say, We've talked about big data. We've talked about the benefits. We've talked about new technology and facial recognition. Hmm? You have a question? Okay, I'll get to you next. Yeah. And then what, what are the issues for privacy? How do we need to think about privacy in an environment where technology will give real benefits to security, but it could also create um, risks that we might not want to take? Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Chris, do you want to start? And then we can go around with that. I'd be happy to. I'd like to thank um, Franz also for introducing a new uh, diagnostic term to my vocabulary, which okay. is careless unemotional. So okay. I think I might be able to use that term even in the absence okay, of okay. big data uh, <laughs> analysis in certain contexts. But um, privacy is a um, really interesting and central topic when it comes to data and data collection. And the 90-day the study was done alongside a report conducted by the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology that surveyed the technological uh, underpinnings of the big data revolution. And uh, that report is also worthwhile reading. I commend it to you. Uh, that report in particular, which our report builds on, um, signaled a, a few trends that are just um, uh, undeniable. Um, and that is simply the, the proliferation of sensors in the devices that we use and have in our homes, also in our workplaces and our cities. The uh, way in which computing and processing are dropping rapidly in cost, and the way in which data storage is dropping rapidly in cost. And what this leads us to is a world in which increasingly data collection is uh, functionally ubiqu ubiquitous. It's simply everywhere. 
and much of that data that's collected is, is effectively permanent. And there are very logical and good incentives that are driving this, and that has to do with the way that data analytics works. We may be collecting data today in a number of different contexts that we discover new uses for tomorrow because the techniques of data analysis that are applicable to that data set have not actually yet been invented. So in that kind of a world, it's very difficult to um, do anything other than legitimately want to collect a lot of different data. Um, so that um, is, a, is a very different uh, world than um, uh, the, a lot of the foundational privacy regulation has grown up in, particularly the uh, very uh, ubiquitous uh, notice and consent regime, um, which is embedded in all of those little user agreements that I'm sure all of us, uh, all of you diligently read like I do before clicking OK on whatever app I just downloaded. Um, so the, the big data report does ask the question of, you know, if we are entering a world in which data collection is functionally ubiquitous and data storage is effectively permanent, does it make sense to increasingly organize the regulation of privacy around the use of data rather than merely its collection? Franz, do you want to do, go next? Well, what uh, uh, over the last few days, but also a little bit earlier, we were discussing is the this concept of privacy by design. So that where you, when you are, you know, collecting or downloading or or getting the data, because indeed you're completely right, it is totally different than uh, 20 years ago. And you 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 make your databases or your data spaces, you organize it in such a way that there are disclosure rules very clearly uh, that automatically, let's say, stop you, like like the automated uh, pilot uh, uh, in a Boeing uh, 747. And I think that is something that we um, we we could work on. And I, I know that uh, that your uh, um, uh, Rob, your, your organization is working on that too. And there is one other thing, however, that I would like to share with you that is uh, from surveys, and I know we have to say surveys are old-fashioned data collection type. We know that young people, in particular in Europe, I don't know exactly how it is in the United States, are less interested in privacy than maybe uh, people of my generation. And um, that is something uh, we have to take into account. Does that mean that they are really less interested in privacy? Or is it uh, only because till now they have not experienced bad things? And I don't know whether the, uh, the report that, that, you were, um, that you have made, whether you, you pay attention to that too. Because if that is a different mindset, a different set of values, then I think it is relevant that we know uh, uh, how to handle. Well, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, uh, subject, uh, to say the least, because on the one hand, people don't care about privacy. Uh, uh, they use uh, search engines, they use uh, uh, Facebook, they use Twitter, and there is on the net, there is on the web, there is almost no privacy anymore. But on the other hand, if you uh, look at the, the Snowden case, people ver feel very uneasy when data are collected by governments. And this leads uh, to the conclusion that this is probably about m mistrust or a lack of trust between the people and those who govern them. And I think that is a real issue because people do not give. Uh, they Well, they, they allow data collection. They think that this might be a good thing. Uh, uh, they collaborate uh, on this, Facebook. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, they do not want uh, that our intelligence uh, services collect all the data needed to protect them. And there is always, traditionally, a balance between privacy and security. What you now see is that the, uh, the, the, the whole debate goes, in my view, uh, in the wrong direction. More privacy and less security. This is already the case, and there are, uh, not only in the US, but also in my country, where it is very difficult for example, now to change the law in order to allow cable signals. That is, that is a crucial uh, element of the whole uh, debate, and it is not really debated in, in the Netherlands in public. Uh, how to deal with it, I don't know yet. Uh, I think time will, uh, will <coughs> change uh, the whole, de whole debate. Uh, but so far, this could have has grave consequences. What we already know is that, for example, uh, criminals, terrorists, they don't use the phone anymore, and they, do use, they don't use the internet anymore, not at least in the, 
um, in, the, uh, in the way they did it before, before they knew that they will survey it on the, uh, on the internet. So it has all kinds of negative uh, uh, consequences, and we should take this into account, and we should uh, change the narrative, and we should explain it more, and it comes back to what I said earlier about the expertise. There is very little expertise. Uh, people do not know what mass surveillance is. They do not know what, uh, for example, uh, metadata uh, data are. They simply don't know, and how it might or might not affect uh, their, uh, uh, their privacy. Thank you. Um, Bob, can I ask one additional thing, which is, given your remarks on the operational benefits, and now we're talking about the privacy implications of that greater data, could you also maybe talk a little bit about what are the requirements for transparency? What are the, what is it citizens need to know that their governments are doing? And after Bob, if any of you want to jump in, then we've got a couple questions. Actually, in some respects, I, I think the discussion about privacy um, limits the discourse that, that we should have been having and we, can, we continue to need to have, and that's just where, where the balances between homeland security and, and our civil liberties are. Um, and this is a discussion that, that I really felt we should have been having even right after 9-11 as we started to think about the, the department standing up. I know that that sounds very esoteric, but really that's what we start to talk about. It's the, the trade-offs of, of things like our privacy for, for security or even a sense of security, and it's, a, it's part of the, the conversation that we need to have. So when we think about, about transparency and, and we think about um, a meaningful dialogue within our communities, um, I, I think there's, there's two points. That technology, I'm going to talk about technology for a mm -hmm. second. Um, you know, technology has, has, the use of technology has two sides. I mean, there's, there's positives and there's negatives. So even something like uh, social media, which, which has uh, been an, an amazing development, um, has its downsides. So if you think about the, uh, the Tottenham riots in the UK, um, social media was used to, to spoof the police. So the police were following the social media and they were protecting the liquor store on Green and 7th while the clothing store four blocks over was getting sacked. Um, that doesn't mean the technology is bad. Uh, it's the use of technology. And I think one of the things that we have to do within the Department of Homeland Security, particularly in Science and Technology Directorate, is engage in conversations with the community um, about what are the acceptable uses of technology um, with, within the country to protect both civil liberties, privacy, and the civil liberties, but still try to meet the, the, the need for a secure homeland. Um, I'll give you, for instance, I, I, I think the issue of, of the framing of how we use drones. We call them UAVs. I knew the debate was, was really changed when they were referred to as drones as a Star Trek fan or a Star, Star Wars fan. Drone was a bad thing, right? Um, but you look at it and you think, okay, here's a technology that could help our first responders in the field. Anybody who's ever been out in the field trying to find an Alzheimer's victim at 3 o'clock in the morning, if you could use a UAV to do that, you could save lives, and you could, and you could, you could save potentially a family a lot of heartache. Um, but we don't engage in the conversations early, in the develop, early enough in the development of technologies, and I think that's one of the areas that, that we could think more broadly about. Um, I'm gonna hit two other points, though, if I could. Um, I have two kids, 18 and 17, and, and they're brilliant. Um, they, they absorb data in ways that I can't. So I say, hey, guys, have you done your homework? And I walk into the rooms, and they're, they're online playing games with friends who they've had for more than 10 years who they've never met. They're texting. They're listening to music. The TV's on. And I look at them and say, shut all that stuff off and do your homework. And they look at me like I got three heads saying we are. They're able to take in information and process it in ways that, frankly, I just can't do as an old person. So I'm not sure that, that we really can re appreciate some of the issues or thought processes that the, that the younger generations are going through as they start to think about themselves and data and privacy, but I think we have to have that conversation with them. The other concern I have about this whole issue of big data, and I'll toss it out because maybe we can have some more discussion, is that if you haven't heard the, the term apophenia, um, you should look it up. It, it's, uh, it's, it's seen fake, um, patterns or, or imagining patterns in data that don't exist. So if, if, I, uh, if I draw a, a dash in two circles, what do you see? It's a smiley face, right? Everybody says, oh, it's a smiley face. No, not really. It's two circles in a, in a dash. Um, we also have to be really careful about the whole issue of crowd fallacy. 
there's a lot of thought that that social media and, 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 and mining big data is, is going to is going to level itself with uh, the wisdom of the crowd. Well, the crowd's not always wise. And one of the things we have to really think about is how can we bring science to understand where the limitations of the da of the data uh, I is. Um, but also, how do we address the validity of some of the data, particularly if we're going to be making really important life, um, you know, life-threatening decisions? Um, so those are two issues that I'll toss on the table of areas that I think we really need to think about as well. Anyone else want to jump in on transparency? Or, yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe oh. uh, um, transparency in terms of um, a thing that I do not find that often in the literature till now, the use that we can make of big data in the field of evaluation. I mean, the United States is, of course, uh, the country for evaluation with your golden years in the 60s, et cetera. Uh, Europe is catching up. But um, the link between the big data that we have, the logs that we have, there is hardly any need now to do you know, before and after measurements and try to recollect the situation how it was four years ago, because that's all locked. And the, the, the world of evaluators is not yet into this. Uh, of course, there are downsides. But in general, if you have the data and you can do your studies over the years for very little money, that can be an input to evaluation, both ex post as also ex ante, that I think is really helping the community. And I think in general, we can say that we should be happy that there is a serious level of evaluations going on, given all the public policy and the money that is involved in public policy. So that could be a new field of utilization for the new field of big data. Well, transparency is not about providing as much inf information as possible, because I'm not really impressed by uh, uh, young kids who are able to do everything at once. Uh, and the reason is that there is a big difference between information and knowledge. Information is not knowledge. And what you see is that, especially young people, but spe let's say the internet generation, although I'm working with the internet uh, for God knows how many years already, and I bought my first computer 40 years ago, so I don't know what the internet uh, 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 generation is, and I know more about computers uh, than, my, than my kids who are in their 20s. So I don't know. Um, it's, no, it's very easily said, eh? so the internet and the young people, but I'm also a professor at the university, and what I notice is that the, the knowledge is not what it was anymore. And the reason is that people, that this generation simply cannot distinguish anymore uh, between right and wrong, between opinions and facts. That's very important because they don't, they are not able uh, to give uh, the information a place. They can't judge the information anymore. And I think that is really underestimated. If you have, if you talk about transparency, then you should know what you have, how to, what kind of interpretation one must give to the information. And if you can't do that, and large groups within the society within an ever or increasingly complex society cannot do that anymore. Now, if you talk about uh, uh, issues like privacy and about uh, the very complex issues of intel collection or the whole NSA debate, you only can judge what's going on if you know something about it and you can place the information about privacy, the NSA, our intelligence services in a broader context, otherwise you reached a, a dead end street and that is highly dangerous. And we, I think that is the, the key issue we should discuss. I, I will say the European Commission, I think is funding a project that will uh, create a tool, a software tool that will be able to distinguish uh, truth from fiction on social network entry. So it'll be interesting to see if it works. My, my solution is to everything is usually there's a software solution. So Chris, you've been, you've been, you've been quiet. Any, anything you want to add to this or should we go to the questions? Sure, I'll, um, I'll throw one example on the table that maybe connects some things that Rob has uh, been discussing in terms of uh, the legitimate exercise of government power um, and some of the privacy issues that have been on the table. And that is actually uh, Rob Griffin's department, the Department of Homeland Security, is featured in the uh, third chapter of the report on uh, the uses of uh, big data in the public sector. 
Uh, there's a really interesting pilot that DHS has embarked on called uh, Neptune. And it's a, it's a data lake. It's a, it's a kind of database that's able to ingest um, an enormous amount of different kinds of information. But what's really interesting is the way in which it ingests this data and then uh, allows uh, people all across DHS to use it. So first of all, it's important to put on the table that the Department of Homeland Security is, is uh, uh, a department in the government that has a full-fledged privacy office as well as a full-fledged civil liberties office that are staffed with experts who um, have a lot of in-house expertise when it comes to uh, law, uh, the law and, and responsible use of data. And they got together uh, in constructing this big data pilot and uh, created a, a massive uh, table of, of meta tagging. Um, this is uh, uh, the ability of databases to add fields of data um, that capture what kind of information is being collected, the authorities and context in which it was collected, and then the uses to which it can be put such that you can have really um, individualized uh, controls over pieces of data. So for instance, if you're a, uh, an agent at the, at the US border um, and you're in primary inspection and somebody comes up to you and, and asks to be admitted to the United States, this database can only show you particular pieces of information that are relevant to your uh, initial determination of entry. Um, whereas uh, uh, investigators in secondary inspection would be able to see quite a bit more uh, DHS investigative agents could see even more, and intelligence agents uh, could still see more. So what this allows in the public sector uh, and could potentially be a, a, a best practice that's, that's much more widely applicable than just in DHS is the very precise um, control and responsible use of data in a way that actually enhances privacy and civil liberties. So you may actually see a situation in which big data and data analytics properly implemented can um, actually enhance and protect privacy to greater degrees. Sorry, thank you. Lorelai Kelly, I'm at the Open Technology Institute at New America Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Lewis, for all your work. I love, um, I'm only a wonk would say this, I love your writing um, for so many years. My uh, question, I walked off a plane at National Airport the other day and I ran into a billboard that said, are criminal hackers ruining your business? Here's one problem, in California, hackers are artists, and in Washington, D.C., they're criminals. Um, I have a real issue with how lots of governance issues with technology are framed always as national security issues. I worked in Congress for 10 years and just saw the migration of complex problem solving go into the military committees, for example. As a national security wonk, I think it's a tenuous place for a democracy to always be categorizing um, technology and national security together as governance. In fact, I would be really interested, and I look at Congress and technology, um, one of the issues that I think we really need to grapple with with the big data revolution is how do we turn this revolution into a policy-making incentive system for evidence-based decision-making? Um, I know that this is really important, especially on issues of climate disruption for a place like uh, the Netherlands. Um, but we don't have a lot of examples out there like what you're talking about, supply chain tracking for legislative policy where experts can be in the room at the right time. Who's doing this? Can we do it? Um, and uh, how can we start putting these best practices together? Because right now, uh, public interest does not have a chance in the US Congress. Don't all speak at once. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, I, I think it's an interesting problem you, uh, you put on the table, but I am, I'm, I am not in the position, nor that I know enough about the American situation to say something about that, but you, you heard the reference to Global Pulse, which is an organization, United Nations, which really tries to use it as an agent for democratization. Um, they use it also uh, by the remote monitoring. So no longer you know, do the traditional monitoring, but remote monitoring. That is actually power to the people. There is nobody in between. It's the people who, who, who give the responses by their behavior, who use their apps, and that is one of the goals of this organization to, to use this information together with other evidence from you know, big evaluations. I think the same could be done for, for security and justice. Uh, but that is a, a new way to go, I think. 
I'm not sure that this is not answering your, your question, but only for a little bit, maybe. That's a good place to start. Thank you. There's a couple other places I'd, I'd point to. One is that, that I think as we, as we look at the, how the environmental movement has used um, geovisualization to explain the impacts of, uh, of climate change. And whether you believe in climate change or not, it's really not important. You can look at the maps and you can make your own determination. When I think about, uh, about community sa resiliency and, and public safety, though, a lot of the work being done at the local level, I think, actually is, um, it, it is pretty sophisticated. Mm. Um, we, we've been running a couple of pilots with California, and in fact, we have a next generation incident command system pilot that brings together lots of community information. Um, and it was, it was just, it's, it's been in use by CAL FIRE in the last year, mm -hmm. was just used in the big wildland firefighters um, in, in San Diego County, but it, it brings in things like, like social media. Um, it, it's designed to be able to, to get better, more actionable information, not just to the first responders, but also to the residents. Um, gives them a sense of, of, you know, where the danger is, where the danger is, is, is as far as their homes and, and as far as they are concerned. It allows the policymakers to start to think about what type of resources that they have to move into place. So the headquarters of CAL FIRE in Sacramento is actually able to look real time at what the conditions are and what the impacts are and what the potential impacts of things like weather change. Um, time of day, th those type of issues um, that, that affect fire flow. And then I'm gonna take it up a level. What, what that, when CAL FIRE has a better understanding of how they need to start to shift resources from the north to the south to deal with that wildland fire, FEMA has the ability to start to think about what kind of resources that they have to make available to California to help um, shelter maybe a million, a million and a half people. Um, and you start to think about all of the systems that go into taking care of those people who had to evacuate and fight that fire, you can start to see where the power of, of data and, and visualization can, can really make a difference in the community. So a lot of the work that, that you see, um, that I personally see as, as, as being really beneficial to the country starts at the local level. What I don't think we've done well is figure out how we, exp how we start to build that as the, as the building block of data that Homeland Security really needs in order to think about the safety of the country writ large. So rather than say top down the way we've done a lot of things, it's got to be bottom up because that's how the communities grow. Okay. So a couple areas you can think about. I, I do share the discomfort with uh, labeling everything a national security problem. And so one of my goals in life is not to put the word security after any problem, yeah. climate security and food security. Food security is not overeating as far as I'm concerned. But please go ahead and if you could identify yourself. I'm Joe Coulter used to be with EchoStorm as the back office of DHS at the NOC and AMOC and back office of DOD for full motion video ISR. And I've seen all this social media stuff and you know, I'd say, where is the world's wealth? It's in rural areas, production, energy, mining, ag, and yet we talk about a system that's vertical. All the data just goes one direction, up. It doesn't go out. My friend Jim Sisko wrote that book called 90% of all the money spent on intelligence was worthless to the warfighter or first responder because all the data went up. It didn't go out. Expertise is distributed. Expertise is not centralized. In fact, rural areas around the world, the expertise is distributed. So I always think people that Snowden told everybody about metadata collection, but it's actual metadata distribution that is really important, not metadata collection. Because if you're gonna evaluate a training program and do nothing about it, why did you evaluate it? So my question to you is, we're great in this country of building bubbles. We built the housing bubble, the internet bubble, uh, the China bubble, and now we have the cyber bubble. And we think it's only about software. But guess what? If the Chinese have the chip at the door and it's part of your system, they, it doesn't matter what you do above the chip. So what are you doing to control your supply chain to make sure you're clean chips of your mission critical systems? How do you do that when the big boys, if you ask them a question, where's their supply chain, they can't tell you. Chris, do you want to 
You're going to skip it? Or? And I have a question for our Netherlands colleagues after that. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I um, came to the White House from the Department of Defense, uh, so I'm sure Rob can uh, follow my answer as well. But um, obviously, uh, security is a paramount challenge in the age that we're living in, and uh, the security of supply chains is one of the hardest dimensions of that. Um, what's interesting is some of the research that's going on um, in places like DARPA that um, have asked the question, okay, if, if um, technological systems are growing so complex in terms of the components that come into them that it's simply impossible to verify them completely. Is there a way that we can actually design a network to work um, where we could actually run it on a, a dirty network, a network that we know is not secure and still uh, achieve for ourselves and our users the degree of operational security that we need? And uh, some of those uh, emerging research approaches are, are quite exciting and may, might perhaps offer uh, partial solutions to the tremendous challenges we face. This is going to be a completely uh, unsatisfying answer, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Um, I don't know if, if Dr. Doug Mon is still here. I didn't see him. No. Is Doug? Okay, he's Doug in the back. Doug. He's a, he, he does a lot of the cyber, um, does the majority of cyber work for science and technology, so I'm going to throw him under the bus because he's not here. When you're done, Doug can give you a much better answer to this than I can. I can. Um, you, you raise a couple of really interesting points, and, and it's, it's also a challenge in this whole area is that um, – You've got to think beyond software. You've got to think beyond hardware. You've got to think about the people as well. Um, I was always fascinated with one of the studies I read coming out of the Pentagon where they were check checking their systems and they freely distributed a bunch of thumb drives in the parking lot. And the number of thumb drives that were then plugged into systems, because people thought they were being nice trying to return them to their owners, but they actually corrupted their systems, was pretty staggering. Um, so, so, you know, you've got these multiple elements that you need to think about. Part of the challenges with, with cybersecurity, too, is that so much of our, of our um, critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. So it needs to be a cooperative relationship between government, the people, and industry. And we really need to think about how we incentivize um, both good practices um, and, and better cybersecurity in, in areas where the government just can't mandate um, what needs to be done. Part of it's going to be Part of it's got to be market driven, but it, part of it's got to be regulatory, and part of it's got to be cooperative as well. So I think that's part of the challenge. The other, the other point that you're getting to is um, a, a, a realization that all of our critical infrastructure is interrelated. And this is a problem we all have with this issue of, of big data and privacy is that the, the technology in, in data is so interwoven with all elements of our lives now that you can't possibly pull the thread most, uh, on, on most of it. I mean, I suppose you could just shut it off and go live in a cabin in Wyoming, but that, that, that's not what most of us want to choose to do. So, so we're going to have to think differently about a system, particularly a system like the Internet, that, that wasn't designed for regulation and control as we start to think about how, how it grew up. Um, I, I didn't have one of the initial apples, but, but I had, you know, uh, well, I, had, I had a whole bunch of old computers I wish I had now because I'd have a, something I could give to the Smithsonian. Um, but but it, th that that whole area is changing so so quickly, and technology is changing so quickly. Um, I'm not being cogent. Um, it, it's an area of, of cybersecurity that um, is is going to take more thought in overlays than than what we've been able to give it. And, and part of it too is that we're going to have to make some hard decisions um, about potentially tightening up on some regulations. Um, also, as, as consumers, pushing a lot of the, the business community to try to do the right things where they may not have been as, uh, as willing to do in the past. That's a, that's a, that's a hard lesson. Well, let me ask our uh, Netherlands colleagues just on supply chain. <clears throat> We've been talking about innovation and how it can benefit governance. To a large degree, innovation is, is dependent on technology and on new technology. And technology is dependent on a global supply chain. So there's risk. How do you think about managing that risk? What do you do about supply chain? Yeah, please. First, we should not overestimate technology. Uh, it is important, and it, uh, it, it, it brought us many things. But um, if you make a comparison, for example, with the military, that's quite interesting. 
it was always predicted that new weapon systems would change the, uh, the art of war completely. This didn't happen. Why not? Because people adapt. And uh, the same uh, holds true for uh, the whole debate on, on uh, metadata, uh, on big data in general. Uh, you ask the question, it, it only goes up, but what comes down? It should come down in, uh, in, um, in the form of analysis that can be trusted. Uh, it should be made available. Uh, only the government has access to those data make an analysis and make it available to the public. I think that is extremely useful. That should, for example, uh, that is something that intelligence services uh, uh, should do. In the Netherlands, uh, they do it. And I think that is absolutely great. Um, so, um, don't overestimate it. And if people feel uh, uneasy, uh, because of they think that they are under surveillance all the time, they will simply change their behavior. That is, that is what they do. They will circumvent. Uh, I'm not too, too worried about it, but we should take this into account. This is what happens if you put so much emphasis on new technologies and on the collection of uh, big data, then people don't do it anymore. That's exactly the reason why I'm not on, uh, on Twitter why I'm not on, 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 on Facebook, and I ask my, uh, my people to be very careful what they put on the service of uh, our computer system. Yeah, uh, Steve Winters, uh, Washington-based researcher. Uh, uh, granting the point about the uh, cabin in Wyoming, uh, I do hear a uh, concern frequently raised, and apparently this has uh, become an acrimonious uh, current debate in Silicon Valley now with the letter of Ka Cory Doctorow to Eric Schmidt. Mainly, uh, while the, the privacy of the individuals in the society seems to be becoming less and less, the privacy of the companies with their own data, such as Google, seems to be becoming more and more, and the governments seem to be spending uh, more time classifying more and more material, making it not available. So some young people, and Dr. O, not so young, uh, see a lack of parity here. If, uh, you know, wh wh where is the principle, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. And, and certainly the types of uh, uh, sentences and um, given to people who've hacked into and released data that they weren't entitled to release are extraordinarily high. Again, showing somebody thinks this privacy is extremely valuable, but not for the individuals. And of course, you could talk about Merkel and everybody else and Feinstein in this regard. So I, 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 this is something I think needs to be addressed because people are worried about it and I often hear it expressed. Sean, on that point, there's a really interesting um, set of policies that the Obama administration has pushed forward now for a number of years on the whole topic of uh, open data and open gov. And if you go to data.gov, you'll see the fruits of a lot of that work. Um, the default has also changed thanks to an executive order. So it used to be the case that uh, government would create data and then uh, uh, data would kind of stay within the government. Uh, the default, um, as mandated by the new executive order, um, is for data to be created in a machine-readable format, and the assumption is unless there's a privacy or security reason uh, for that data to be uh, released to the public. And this is a very different way of looking at data. It's a way that uh, treats data like a national resource rather than like something that's uh, simply for the exclusive use of government. So there's actually now in some departments uh, kind of data entrepreneurs whose job it is to um, receive requests from outside the agency and then to look for uh, data that agency may hold that could be valuable to somebody in some way. And a world in which um, data is increasingly able to be applied to a variety of things, um, this is certainly, I, I think, a, a national asset. I usually think of the Netherlands as an innovative country. Uh, maybe you don't feel that way on the inside, but from the outside it looks that way. So what are you doing about data and the things Chris is talking about? Mating, I, it's an important initiative to make data available. We have also an open data policy. Uh, to start with Statistics Netherlands, one of the biggest uh, organizations which combines uh, registered data going back to 15 years. So we don't have a national census anymore because we have a virtual census. 
So we combine all these data, and they are open. They have a website where you can make your own calculations. So you want to find out whether a second marriage is okay for you, given your age or your third marriage, you just do it. I recently gave a, an, a, a, at a party, I, I made it a little up, but it was somebody who was marrying the third time with a wife which was 15 years younger, and I calculated his mortality risk, which of course was not, not completely, it was a little bit of a joke, but that's open data, it's all there, hundreds of variables. I, I hope you didn't tell him. him. Yeah. <clears throat> I told him at the end, yes, yes, for sure. <clears throat> and it was a good friend, so, so don't worry. Uh, that is one. Uh, with regard to data from crime and justice, of course, you have to be a little bit more careful. You don't want to give the callous, unemotional psychopaths the data, uh, suppose that they could read it. But trends over time are available at the website of my institute. And again, you can calculate the, the reoffending risk on the basis of our reoffending index. Of course, dear colleagues, one big thing, these data are not you know, uh, specified with name and where they live. They are completely anonymized. But that is a way to, to maybe win some trust by being open. Um, but the policy on big data is, is in the making of the, at this moment. So that's why I find reports so interesting, because you bring all these things together. I used to work at a place called the National Opinion Research Center, NORC. NORC yeah. yeah, and we had this data, we had anonymized census data, and you could waste endless hours typing in ridiculous correlations, you know, like, did the weight of pigs in Iowa predict the smoking patterns in Chicago and things like this? And often, I thought, I don't really need to ever do research again. I can just do ridiculous correlations off huge data. May I, may I say one thing back on that? I think that one of the findings in the research literature is that innovations often come from clashes of disciplines, uh -huh. some lonely intellectuals doing this, the things that you are doing, and then suddenly there is something new. So who knows? <laughs> That's very touching. Uh, we had one more. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, my name is Tanan Sepp. I'm uh, from the Embassy of Estonia. Um, and um, as the Netherlands, uh, I think Estonia has also profited quite a lot in, in uh, using innovative solutions and, and all kinds of e-solutions. And we've talked now quite a lot about public interest. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's also individual interest. Um, just as an example, um, in, in Estonia's case, uh, the main policy for, for the government for, uh, towards individuals is that uh, you ask certain things just once. I mean, your name doesn't change, your birth of date doesn't change. So by this, you, you can make it, make it uh, easier for people to interact with the government. And people will be more willing to interact, actually. But being here as an observer um, in, in, the st in the States, um, creating this kind of trust um, environment is quite difficult. This mistrust towards, towards the government is, is re inherent. So as a kind of joke, uh, how, can we, uh, how can the government create conditions or the environment for people to, to give more data without people being afraid that the government will take the, their guns away. Thanks. And maybe I can add something to that, which is for our, our uh, European colleagues. Um, what do you think about similar attitudes in Europe? Do you have the same kind of distrust? Is it different or is it uh, very much the same? But why don't we start with the uh, Americans to answer the question about black helicopters and then we'll go to our, our Netherlands. Uh, no one wants to touch it. Yeah. <laughs> boy, yeah. boy, this could be a career-ending answer. Um, we'll, we'll show it. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> thanks. Uh, you know, there's a... Uh, <laughs> the country is based on distrust of the government. Um, and I don't think it's changed since its founding. Um, so where you're getting at is, is part of the, the I, I think, a, a very actually healthy relationship between the people and its government. Um, you know, you hear adages about, you know, that government's best, that government's least, and, um, you know, those, those that try to, to change, uh, you know, freedoms for security, you know, get neither. Um, I, I think there's a few things that we have to do. I think that, that we have to 
as a government at all level, need to be transparent on, on what we use the data for and, and what the community good is that people can get from it. Because I think if people can, can understand that, uh, particularly at the local level, that the, the, the data, the better the data, the better our opportunity to provide them the basic services that, that they need to be able to live their lives um, the, way they, the way they choose um, in as safe an environment as you possibly can. Um, I, I think the open standards that you talked about, I think the availability of data and understanding of what we're doing with the data, particularly at the, the federal level, becomes really important. Uh, I will give you a story from, from my background. I was the fire chief in Loudoun County, which is where Dulles Airport and West was on 9-11. On and um, we sent lots of units in to, to deal with the Pentagon on, after, after the attack. Um, after 9-11, um, the federal government came to me and said, Chief, can you give me the, the list of your critical infrastructure? I said, sure, okay, we could do that. So in six months afterwards, I, I, I called them back up and said, um, could you tell me, you know, could you share with me what you do with that data? And they said, no, it's all been classified. <laughs> and I said, but you wouldn't have known that data unless I gave it to you. And they said, we still can't share it with you. <laughs> I said, okay. I mean, it's, it's, part, of, um, it, it's part of the, the you know, part of the concern that we have to have is that we, we, we can't overclassify data. I mean, we, we have to be concerned about national security. It's, a, it's a, one of our, the primary goals of government. I don't care who you are, if you think about all of the thinkers, even Adam Smith, who saw no role in government other than the market, still said government had some role in, in, in protecting the security and safety of people. Um, I was going somewhere else with this, and it's uh, it's gone. I'm sorry. It's been sort of a long day already. Um, but what I think what I think we, we have to be be really careful of is that you can't overclass overclassify to the point where where we we lose the the public thread on why we're doing is important and, and what service it provides back to the people. Because again, that becomes the basis of the, the most important debate that we should be having, whether it's in town hall or in the halls of Congress, what do we want to trade off? What do we really want to collect and what we don't? So that we understand that if we're not going to collect some type of data and something occurs, that you can't go back and point the finger. You know, and it's sort of that gotcha mentality that gets us into this really bad to-do mm -hmm. loop sometimes with government about trying to be absolutely perfect rather than be honest about where our threats and risks are and what the reality is of, 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 of you know, the fact that it can be hard to be safe. Um, and sometimes we lose that discussion. Sorry, that wasn't as cogent as I wish it was, but it's a, you understand the thought process. No, and I brought up an interesting point that isn't always uh, uh, obvious, I think, to non-American audiences, which is the, uh, the federal nature of the United States. And so when you were talking, I was thinking about people don't trust the federal government, but when you go down the chain, in state governments, you don't see the same level of distrust. And when you get to local governments, very intense politics, but I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like the same level of distrust is there. So one, one thing people don't always recognize is the division of power in the U.S. among the states, the, the federal government. And one of the sources of distrust is the federal government playing a bigger role. So, so the system was, was based, you know, to be inefficient. Let, let's be really honest. And, and as, disclo as a disclosure, I teach state and, and local government at Georgetown. So if I get too professorial, you know, there's 89,500 different forms of government in the United States, predominantly at the local level. When you start to think about special districts, school committees, counties, towns, municipalities, the preponderance of government is at the local level, and they are all different. Okay, so the, the federal government and the states were designed to be in conflict by the Constitution, if you really think about it. It's a balance of power. So now when people say, why can't government be efficient? Because fundamentally, the Constitution was designed as a balance of power, not to create an inefficient government. And sometimes that gets lost in this whole discussion. There's this whole issue of state rights and certainly this idea of, of local governments. The other thing that you find, um, I find fascinating looking at, at, at polling and polling data is the fact that everybody else's congressman stinks except for mine. 
You know, so there are some really bipolar issues with this country as far as government, the expectation of government, what type of services they want to deliver, um, and certainly with taxes, um, that makes it a, a real challenge sometimes to govern. But there, there are enormous differences even in, within the country about expectations of what the role of government should be, and it's not ubiquitous. There's 89,500, I want to say 34 was the last time I taught the classes about a month and a half ago. 40,000 of them are in the district. Right? Yeah. So no. that, uh, it's really, did, and, and it could be everything from a mosquito district in Idaho to, you know, the, the state of California. I mean, so, I mean, it really run, runs the gamut, but each one of them is proud of their, of their role and, and very protective and parochial of their powers. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? No, it's I just say that it's it's very clear with the technological trends um, that that face us that it, it's time, as the report calls for, a, a national conversation on a lot of these issues because a lot of the issues that are faced, particularly in, in health and education, are going to affect all of our lives at every level of government and uh, in our interactions with with private firms as well. And they certainly merit a very uh, rich public discussion. And in, in the Netherlands, I know you used to have the what, the Wassenaar Agreement, and there was a lot more. Co comedy between C O M I T Y uh, between uh, government and the public um, is that still the case? Is this sort of that the problem? Do you have the same sort of distrust? We have a political scientist here. <laughs> they know everything. Know <laughs> everything. No, but there is a lot of mistrust, and uh, things have changed in the Netherlands, and not only in the Netherlands. If you look at uh, at the polls and the results of elections, then. In most countries, approximately 30 percent, 30 percent of the people is willing to vote for extreme parties, either to the left or to the right, uh, and this is a clear uh, signal of of mistrust. Uh, because if you trust the government and if you trust the elite, because it's 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 uh, it's a matter of trusting uh, the elite, then this would not have happened, and it's perfectly uh, explainable because uh, globalization reached a new phase. Um, people fear uh, for their jobs, uh, the economy is not doing that well, Econom economy is linked to security, so it, it will make people very uneasy and then people will look for, uh, uh, for the right answers and they cannot be provided by the existing uh, leadership. So this is not, uh, not really something new, this, we have uh, had periods in history uh, before but it's particularly bad and it will not go away very quickly. And this has, of course, uh, to do with the monumental change that they are taking place now globally. And this will affect, this will affect uh, for, a quite, for quite a long time. At, le at least that is what, uh, what people believe, uh, uh, the, the, the feelings of large parts of uh, the population. Uh, and this, of course, has, is, is linked to the whole debate we just had about uh, big data, uh, about uh, surveillance, what have you. This will be a, 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 a critical issue, and this will be one of the major issues the political class has to deal with, and they should come up with an answer. If not, uh, you will have uh, an erosion of, uh, of the, de the democratic uh, system, if we like it or not. Sorry, if I push the button, yeah. Um, 2.8 billion people currently live in cities in developing nations versus 900 million in developed nations. This is according to the, to the ANSI workshop that was just held in D.C. in November. Global urban growth is expected to add an additional 2 billion new residents by 2050. An additional 2 billion. So you start to think about the issue, the, some of the issues that, that you were talking about, which I'm in complete agreement with this, with this an enormous change in what we think about as far as community and society globally. Um, this issue of big data and understanding communities and understanding the health of, of systems and, and being able to make sense of, of, um, of what it's trying to show us is going to be with us for long and it's really going to be critically important as we start to think about what the next 20 to, to or, sorry, that 40 to 50 years is going to bring as far as our, our children and grandchildren. Okay, we're only two questions away from a drink, so I promise no more jokes. Uh, we had one, here, one question here, yeah. And please identify yourself, yeah. Uh, I'm Samira Daniels. I am um, uh, with Ramsey Decision Theoretics. I have a little bit of an academic interest in uh, analytics, which actually dates back to the 80s. 
um, you raised this issue of um, information versus knowledge in ter in, as a generational um, issue. And, um, you know, uh, I see this, uh, at, 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 and while you're right, uh, I think that it's also a cultural issue um, in the intelligence community, across intelligence communities. And, and, and I think that th this battle of information and knowledge has, has, be, has been waged for a long time within the agencies. And I, I think that that, uh, uh, you know, I've followed Locke Johnson's uh, scholarship. I don't know if you know him, but he's at uh, University of Georgia. And um, I, I think that if, unless this, or this is handled organizationally in, in a more robust way because there are just so many different cultures, informational cultures, uh, it, it's, gonna be, it, it's gonna be compounded with, with, uh, with this whole issue of, you know, and I'll pursue it. I don't wanna go, you know, it won't take too much time. Uh, but I was just wondering if, if, that may, if you sort of see that at all, that, you know, that these stovepipes and then the competition for funds and all of this falls into this whole issue. Oh, oh, definitely. Thank you very much for the question, because the whole, uh, you, what you see is that stovepiping is, is more common now among the people, but also in large organizations, including uh, uh, ministries. And that has something to do, of course, with the complexity of the, of the issues. Uh, it is very difficult. Uh, to get an understanding of what is going on. Now, this is highly dangerous uh, because what you see is that we move, uh, uh, the technology push becomes more and more important and then technology gets its own dynamics. In my view, this is wrong. It should be technology push, a uh, pull. Uh, but you can only have technology pull if you know what you're talking about. So you need knowledge, you need concepts, uh, you need to organize uh, uh, your, your knowledge. If you don't do that, then you only get technology uh, push, and that is, uh, that is dangerous. Uh, and this should also be a part of this, uh, this culture of security innovation about which the Secretary General uh, uh, talked. If you don't do it, it's, it's technology driven and it will lead nowhere. What would, uh, what would you want to see? <clears throat> it's a setup, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a basketball term. What would you want to see? What would you do if you could pick one thing? Chris, you just wrote a huge report. What would? Uh... Yeah. Well, the, uh, my first uh, observation would be to make the starting salaries in government the same as the starting salaries in Google. Uh, but uh, the Ford and uh, MacArthur Foundation actually uh, just produced a very thoughtful report that looked at the whole question of um, how, how can we have more technologists enter public service. The um, barriers to entry, obviously, uh, uh, are uh, profound, uh, given the tremendous draw um, that uh, their services uh, uh, bring in the private sector. But um, that said, uh, you know, this is a uh, big data technology is, uh, is usually scalable technology. And by that, I mean a very small number of people with uh, a comparatively small amount of resources in governmental terms can do amazing things. So I'm actually quite hopeful that each department in their own way, as they see, you know, what the relevance of, of the technology is to their mission, how it can perhaps help them carry out their mission better, 
we'll adopt it, uh, and we'll adopt it strategically in a, in a planned kind of way, and in a way that hopefully uh, does measurably enhance the delivery of public service. Anyone else? Maybe um, serious education may help. Mm -hmm. That doesn't imply always accredited education, because unfortunately, from the time that I was Chief Inspector of Education in the Netherlands, I know, and that's still there, that there is a kind of commerce in accreditation. If you ask me what a serious good education takes a little bit longer given the drink that you are offering us. So, but that, that I think could be because if you have that and you have open data, you have, you have the material that is hanging around and it is more than low hanging fruit that can empower society. That I think would be on my agenda, but that is much broader, of course, than security and justice. And I'm actually not sure whether the theory is, uh, is correct, which is sometimes the case with theories. No, I fully agree. And do not ignore the soft side, the conceptual side. If you do it, uh, then you have innovation for the sake of innovation, which will lead nowhere. You know, I, I think part of the challenge is that um, what what we have assumed to be to be sort of state actors or, or state capacities is changing so dramatically. Mm -hmm. we, we we haven't talked about nanotechnologies or or 3D printing or, or what that could potentially mean in the, the whole issue of bio. We certainly haven't scratched deeply enough into the issue of cybersecurity and and the difference between what a couple of guys in the basement can do versus versus the state. Um, I, I think one of the areas that that government in, in particular and S&T within DHS really has got to, to do a better job of understanding is the, the intricacies and, and interrelationship between our important subsystems. Um, Charles Perot, if you haven't read him, talks about the issue of complexity. And basically he says that complex systems fail complexly. And we have to be very, very careful about that. It seems logical, but you know, let's talk about um, Japan for a second. They had a good plan on how to deal with a, a nuclear accident. They had a good plan on how to deal with an earthquake. They actually had a plan on how to deal with an eight-foot tsunami. What they didn't have was a plan that dealt with a 12-foot tsunami that had hit after an earthquake that hit a nuclear plant. So we have to start to think differently about the interconnectivities of our, of our society. And it's both, it's both soft and hard. I mean, we've got to figure out different ways that we can communicate some of the, 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 the threats, some of the risks, and some of the expectations of the community, because they've got to be resilient if we are going to be resilient as a community. So that's sort of what, what I would as, you know, think about as part of the, the, the dream package of work that, that we do. Mr. Secretary General, do you have any final words you'd like to share with us? Uh, here's the microphone. Well, I think that uh, we only raised a, sp a specific type, but not deep enough. Uh, but we have one and a half hour. So I think they did a good job on the panel. Uh, but uh, we have some rem made some re remarks on how we get to innovation. <coughs> That can't be a technology push. It has to be a pull. It has to be about thinking. It has to be soft and the hard side. And of course, the privacy issue is, especially in the Netherlands, a very interesting but also tough, uh, a tough issue for the next few years. I thank you very much and also the members. Great. Well, we do have a uh, uh, reception with uh, drinks and some uh, appetizers and hors d'oeuvres out in the room behind you. But before you uh, head towards them, please join me in thanking the panel.